Hello, welcome everybody uh, to today's webinar. This is webinar three, uh, Proofs of the Soil Regeneration Works. And uh, before we get started, we'll uh, allow everybody a chance to join. If you can, in the chat window, go ahead and uh, tell us where you're coming from. We'd like to see uh, who's coming from where in the world. And we usually have a very international audience. And I see that we already got uh, somebody from Brazil. We got uh, India. A lot of folks from United States. We got Canada representing Sweden. It usually takes just a, probably about 10 seconds and I think we hit almost every continent in the world. <laughs> it's amazing to see you know, how many people from around the world are interested to understand about uh, soil regeneration and, and uh, the work we do around soil biology. Sicily and Lithuania and Zimbabwe, yeah. India. <laughs> It's great. Lots Look at that. People from all over Honduras, Northwest Kansas. Ooh. I still tell you, Elaine, <laughs> one of these days we're going to get an Antarctic person. <laughs> one of these days. So she says that all of those glaciers are melting and now, now there's actually land that the weeds are coming up on. <laughs> exactly. It'll be one of those days when we're like, okay, we finally hit yep. every continent. <laughs> Ireland and Madrid, Spain. Ooh. Prisca, South Africa. That's Sandra. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we've got a little bit of housekeeping uh, items to go through. So uh, the kind of our webinar rules of engagement, um, all the participants will be in muted mode uh, for the duration of the webinar. That just makes sure that we cut down on background noise. We usually have hundreds, if not thousands of people that join these webinars, so that makes sense. And then also we're gonna have a, a fairly significant Q&A session today. So if you would like to have a question uh, answered by the panelists, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I'll have a slide that will, will give you a little bit more details around that, but uh, you can go in and start placing your questions there. And also we have a chat uh, window as well, and this is a great opportunity for you to converse with other attendees, other participants. And usually that, that chat window is usually pretty busy with a lot of uh, sidebar discussions that are happening. Okay, um, I also want to talk about our Healthy Planet webinar series, the ones that we're, we're doing it in the month of April. We've already had webinar one and webinar two, which is understanding soil health and how to restore soil health. And those are recorded and the portal that you use to attend this webinar, you can go and look at the recordings. And we also have our January series in there as well. If you haven't uh, had a chance to attend that or watch that, I highly suggest watching those as well. And then today is webinar three, proof that the soil generation works. And we have a really fantastic guest today, Ray Archuleta. And so we'll, we'll have Ray introduce himself in just a minute. And then we have webinar four, which is careers in soil regeneration. And this will be talking to folks that are actually out there doing this kind of work, uh, helping um, farmers and uh, land managers uh, restore the soil biology and the soil health. And so you get to talk about, and, and you get to ask questions of the folks that are actually kind of doing that work. So today's topic is going to uh, be with Ray Archuleta. He's gonna do a case study presentation and it will roughly run about 40 minutes and then we'll have a Q&A session afterwards. So we'll have a lot of time for us to be able to answer your questions. We expect that the total time of today's webinar will be about an hour and 40 minutes. And if we got a lot of questions and we run a little bit long, we may do so, but uh, we'll, we're really scheduling for about an hour and 40. And now let's talk about uh, who our panelists are today. So I'm gonna introduce or have uh, everybody on the panel introduce themselves. So, so Ray, if you wanna go off mute and introduce yourself. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good night. <laughs> it's for the all, <laughs> depending where you're at and what part of the planet. My name is Ray Art. Yeah, all spectrums. My name is Ray Archuleta. I'm a retired um, district conservationist, uh, conservation agronomist, and a professional soil scientist. I worked for NRCS uh, USDA for 30 years. Now I run my little pear sheep ranch. I have a 155 acre ranch here in Southern Missouri, and I'm honored to be here to do Elaine's. Elaine was one of the persons that really inspired me to really understand about biology. Great, thanks, Ray. Elaine. Okay, I'm Dr. Elaine Ingham. I'm one of the founders of the Soil Food Web School. Um, have worked in this area of uh, knowledge for the last 45 years. So I've been around to see quite a change in attitude about uh, what biology does in the soil. Uh, when I first started, 
um, most people just said the microorganisms in the soil, they, they're just there. They don't do anything. Well, surprise, they do everything. And if you want to be able to uh, very inexpensively raise um, crops or animals, you have to get the biology back into doing what they're supposed to be doing in the soil, which is helping you make money, I guess. Okay. Great. Thanks, Lynn. Adam. Hi, I'm Dr. Adam Cobb. Uh, many of you have seen me here on webinars popping in and out. I um, have spent seven months here at Soul Food Web School as a content creator, especially for some of our um, advanced courses that we're putting out, and then um, also just doing science communication with the public. So but prior to that, I had about a 10 year um, career in academia, doing research and some teaching and especially studied the symbiosis of crops with um, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. So I came in with a single organism and then got here to the school and now I have a whole playground of organisms to learn about. Great, thanks Adam. And I am Brian Vag. I um, own a company called Sprouting Soils. I am a soil food web consultant. And I'm one of those people that uh, had kind of a, a midlife career change. I used to work in the high tech industry my wife and I had a homestead and uh, we were growing our own food and we wanted to know about better ways. And I came across uh, Elaine. I saw a number of videos and I got hooked right away. And I decided, you know what, after I, I went through the foundation courses um, and started to educate myself uh, about soil biology, I decided to make a, a, a major career change. And now I own my own company and I'm helping farmers and land managers um, restore their land. Um, so it's been quite a journey and something that uh, has been very inspiring for me to go through. So, okay, that's our panelists for today. So let's go ahead and uh, before we, we get into Ray's uh, a case study, we wanna do a quick poll. So we are always asking uh, kind of a question from you folks. We wanna know where you're coming from. Um, are you coming from a farmer, rancher, grower perspective and kind of looking for a better way? Or are you looking to have an impactful career helping farmers and land managers kind of do that transition to regenerative agriculture? And so I think we're going to kick off that poll. Here we go. And we'll let it run for probably about 30 uh, to 40 seconds. Then we'll go ahead and close that down. And while you guys are taking your poll, we're going to uh, also talk about the Q&A session and how that's going to work. So if you look at your Zoom window, down at the very bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A button where the arrow is highlighting towards. If you have a question, uh, go ahead and put your question into that chat box. And um, we'll go ahead and pick and choose a number of the questions for the panelists to, to, to discuss in our Q&A session later today. Okay, uh, Ray, I'm gonna go ahead and hand this over to you. So let me stop sharing. And Ray, just let you know you're on mute. There we go. Yeah. There we go. And let me see if we can do this. It's looking good. I see you're, uh, you're sharing. Yep. Yeah. Can you see that? And then I got to just get that off my screen. Can you just see one slide? No, right now we're seeing the, um, the presenters mode. Both. So that, yeah. Okay. Okay. Hold on a second. We don't want to do that. No, I, I did it again. <laughs> and you're supposed to go into, let's see, share. Let's see. Do, 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 uh, oh, here we go. Okay, let me get this right. Sure, no problem. Uh, only, okay, so uh, who can share only? Okay, you got that already. And when I do this bottom one here, uh, okay, share screen. There we go. And how about go. now? That's looking much better. Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> it. Yay, Lane's so excited that I did it right. Uh, again, uh, thank you, Lane, for having me. I really appreciate it. And then uh, just kind of put a slide here that I'm also a co-founder of Soul Health Academy and co-owner of Understanding Ag. Um, I... We started this because, to be honest with you, we didn't like what was coming out of the universities. And we started, we wanted to teach more of an ecologically based agriculture. And uh, Gabe and I, Brown, we've always had this dream 
that we would open a little school so that we could teach and um, teach producers more of an ecologically focused type of agriculture. And, and not just the producers, but anybody interested in that. So I'm gonna start off uh, again, biomimicry. And I, I uh, termed, I got that phrase from Janine Banyas. And I love that mimic nature, a new framework. And I wish this was the framework I would have had when I left college and for enhancing soil function. And so what I'm gonna show this case study, why I chose Rick Clark from Indiana, because uh, what he's trying to do is one of the most difficult things in modern agriculture, how to farm without chemicals, fertilizer, and without tillage. That is the number one asked question as I go throughout the country. And, and I'm telling you, I have been everywhere. That's my flight pattern for the last, since 2007, Elaine. Uh, you probably traveled as much as much. I've been to Canada, Mexico. I've been all over. And, and I was very fortunate that I was able to do this with the NRCS and to be able to spread the soil health gospel to all over the place because we really needed that, because I'm gonna be brutally honest, I was very, very discouraged and I'll sh share that. Because what I'm gonna share here in this first few slides before we get to Rick, is to provide a proper framework on how all this came about and that it wasn't an accident, it was a predestined, beautiful journey. And here's one of the things I started realizing as I was traveling the whole country and a common pattern that I started noticing that most people don't understand these basic, basic con uh, concepts, even after we have gone to college, even if you took ecology, even if you uh, understand the, uh, this concept of relationship, uh, I find out a lot of farmers, a lot of people don't understand all is one. It really means that relationship and connectness. What I learned in college is disconnectness. A lot of our school was taught in what I call little silos. I took agronomy, plant science, soil science, all in the silos, everybody in ecology, different departments. And then what I walked away with is a very fragmented view of life and, and did not understand the connectness. And I call it the butterfly effect. And we'll talk about that in a second and how, the, how intimately connected is the biology in our planet. The number two thing is I found out that a majority of people do not know that the soil is alive. And I tell farmers, if you do not understand that basic concept, you will not change your operation. You won't change it. That soil is just as alive as you. It breathes, it reproduces. There's a consciousness to it, an intelligence to it. It's a beautiful design. You don't get that? Sorry, can I help you? I tell that to producers. Third is it's not about, we have to understand, I teach how to mimic nature's design design principles, patterns, patterns and principles. I rather have that than a person that understands those concepts than be enthralled with data. Data is important, but you need to understand how the system works. And the last part I'm gonna talk about is, and, and Rick Clark's part of this, what makes these regenerative farmers so distinctly different? And I'm exposed to thousands but it's only the cream of the cream float to the top and what makes them so brilliant. So what started down this journey right here? This, is a, this started me down this journey, Rick and all these producers. This is a great graph of, let's go back here. This is a great graph showing this has been happening for a long, long time. Since the 1920s is the cost of inputs. Farming and ranching has become not a blessing to the land, but almost a form of bondage, financial bondage. I tell farmers, you're the poorest millionaires I know because you're indentured servants to the inputs and income has always been really low. That's what got me started in 2001, 2002. And I started questioning. Working for NRCS, we were, my agency was uh, designed to stop this. If you see this picture on the left, that's, that's Colorado in 2014. And folks, here's 1935. I want you to look at the color of that soil. This is a picture actually taken of the Dust Bowl. Notice I put this organic. I put this here because all of our plant, a majority of our planet was already destroyed in an organic system. Tillage, overgrazing, 
deforestation. There was no chemicals. And I think people get so caught up, organic chemicals and all that, they lose perspective. It's not about organic. It's about regeneration. Because I've been around organic systems that are just as degraded, uh, just degrades, degrades the soils just as bad as any other system. And just to show you this quick little video here, I just want to remind us where it, we're at. Notice this is, uh, this is Western Kansas in 2021. Look at the top research papers blowing nutrient management plants. This is where we're at. We're supposed to have the best universities in the world. This is data-driven systems. This is our background, where we came from. What happened? Don't we, aren't we supposed to have some of the best universities in the world? Haven't we done gobs and gobs of research? And here's where we're at. Our soils used to be like this. Now they're like this. So what happened to us? What, why this problem? And as I travel across the country, and this is a global problem. And I love this book. And it's, I think this is a, a, some of you might have read him. Dr. Nassim Talib is a statistician. And I love his statement. He says, careful with data. You'll drown in it. So what's my point? We forgot the, what's the most important goal is to emulate nature, be an incredible observer. If I would have had one professor, one professor said, Ray, your goal is to emulate nature, your farm, your ranch, she emulated. You can't tell the difference because if it's beauty, you should be able to hear it, you should be able to see it, and you should mimic its patterns. That was not taught to me. But I think the next science that's gonna really help us down the biological realm is this. And this is the reason I'm bringing this into play because when we get to Rick's, you'll understand that when I met Rick and I met all these farmers, it was an absolute amazement thing. It was just what I call this butterfly effect. What does this mean? I think in the future, we're gonna learn more about biology is through quantum physics. I read a lot of things on quantum physics. Do I understand it? No. But I get such an appreciation about it and the entanglement and the beauty of it. Let's make sure everybody understands classical physics. All of us have taken that in our high school and our college. It just tells us about location, physical laws, trajectories. It's really, that's what governed a majority of the science. Now we're talking about quantum physics where we have in such incredible entanglement where these particles in the quantum level can communicate through the physical plane. You can have one particle change and then the other part of the galaxy, it also changes. What quantum physics and quantum mechanics is teaching us, the incredible connectness of things. And I definitely recommend everybody to read this book if you have a chance. It's called Chaos by James Glick. And, and I think it's a fantastic book. Part of the story is about Edward Lorenzo, he's the one that uh, actually termed the butterfly effect. Brilliant mathematician. Dr. Edward Lorenzo is a, and a, and a great meteorologist. He's the one that came with the term, the butterfly effect. Why am I bringing this to bear? Bear with me a second. The way the butterfly effect works is like this. Can the wings, the flapping of the wings and the and this butterfly moving the molecules under the wings, can it create a tornado in Kansas? We know now through science, yes, it can. The movement of the molecules of, the, of, of that butterfly can change this beautifully connected system and also has such an impact, they can create a tornado effect in Kansas. What we are knowing now from science that no matter how sophisticated our, our science is, how incredible it is, that one change in a biological system can change the total outcome. Dr. Lorenzo said this very incredible statement. He says, no matter if you took all the sensors, get super, super computers, take away all the errors, and you put sensors the height of Mount Everest, you cover every square foot, you will never predict the weather. One tiny change will change everything. This is how the butterfly effect happened for me and happened for Rick Clark. 
my my butterfly effect started with this man Ray Styers and Steve Groff. They one day Steve Groff gave a talk in 1995, and I was so impressed on how he spoke and what a regenerative farmer he is. Ray Styers has been rolling cover crops for since the 1980s. Bobby Brock, who is the state agronomist in North Carolina, when I moved to North Carolina, he took me to under his wing and took me to Ray Styers. Ray Styers have been rolling cover crops since the 80s. In fact, he's no longer, he has not used phosphorus and he has not used any nitrogen and he's reduced his herbicides from five to one. Ray Styers did that. In fact, I would help him roll cover crops during, during, my, uh, during my work time and after work on the weekends, I would help roll covers and look at the equipment that he was using at that time. This is amazing. That piece of equipment not only was broken and the springs did not work in that no-till drill, but because his soils were so forgiving and he was rolling cover crops since the 1980s, his organic matter was six and a half percent. The forests were three. He has been rolling cover crops for years. So which leads us to the next person that we're talking about, Rick Clark, how all these tiny butterfly effect, these little persons you come into contact when I heard Elaine speak one time or uh, uh, Rick heard somebody else speak. All these people had this interconnectedness that happened at the right time and it created an incredible change. There's a picture of Rick and I have to put Dan to Sutter. I cannot separate those two because Dan and Rick are probably leading in the nation and this no-till organic, and they're doing it on large acres. Uh, Rick's doing it on seven, Dan's doing it on 5,000. In fact, both of them have a common story. They both started with conventional agriculture, then they went to no-till and covers, and now they're trying to do something extremely incredible if they can pull it off. But let me tell you something, you have to have very deep pockets you have to have very good businessmen to be able to do this because I'm gonna tell you it's cost them thousands and thousands of dollars to shift. I do not recommend going to organic no-till unless you have the financial and the emotional and you have the technical abilities to be able to carry out. It is incredibly difficult to do this and we'll talk about this, okay? so. My friend, Rick Clark, is a fifth-generation farmer. He's been practicing for this for 35 years. His wife, Carol, he's got uh, Jessica and his daughter, Rachel, and um, his daughter, Richard. And it's interesting how this whole journey started for them. Again, um, they started, they live in Indiana, and Rick Clark and Dan DeSutter talked to each other all the time. And here's what I want to say. When you go down this journey of regeneration, don't do this by yourself. Do this with a community of people that think like you. I tell farmers, if the moment you do this by yourself, it's going to take you forever to get to, get to this point because nature is incredibly complex and elegant. So they did soybeans, no-till soybeans for 15 years. Then he went to no-till corn for 10 years and then cover crops for the last 10 years. He's been farming green for the last eight years. You notice this progression of, of going down this system. I think people wanna go from a conventional to organic no-till right away, you will fail. Your soils are not ready. You're taking these bacteria dominant soils and you wanna shift them to more of fungal dominant, you're gonna collapse in your face. And this is why a lot of people have failed. They did not understand their context of their soils and where they're at. This is a, a great uh, little video showing what Rick is doing. He is rolling his cover crops. Again, we, Ray Styers has been doing this since the eighties using cereal rye. And what I love about cereal rye, you roll it and it's easy to terminate, no herbicide. And you hit it at, this, uh, at the dough stage in senescence. And you hit it at that critical stage in the no-till planter, they are actually planting right into it. Corn, soybeans, we're doing this with pumpkins. We're doing this with squash. You're doing this with chili peppers. 
CRI is one of the foundational things that we're doing. We are now doing this on millions of acres, folks. Again, we started promoting that. My slide set going around since the 2007, 2008, taking race slides. And now we're having this on major acres. Again, this is another video showing another uh, video no tilling right into Balanza. And, uh, and it's another way of using a permanent green cover. This is what we mean, planting green. What I love about this, you're feeding microbes and biology to the last minute, covering the soil, and then that Balancia is really easy to terminate. And, and so even if it, and what we just want is get the corn a head start to suppress it. And that's the only thing we want to do. And then if the clovers are growing with the corn, it's not a big deal. But that's what, and we're using clovers and winter peas. And the logistics is incredible in this, folks. It's a whole series of class just to learn how to design the mixes and put this together. This is not for the faint hearted, okay? Also, Rick, also, he uh, designed this incredible machine. It's a little miniature hydraulic mower. So in each row, he is mowing the, the weeds. Notice he will not disturb that soil surface because you disturb that soil surface, you wake up our strategies bacteria, and then you're just going to get more weeds in the, in, the, in, the, in the problem. So he does not want to bring the weed seeds to the top of the surface. That machine was made by them. Brilliant engineers that can be able to carry that. Okay. Very amazing. Here's the result. That cereal is aleopathic, releases natural uh, uh, herbicides that suppress weeds, creates that blanket. And then soybean and corn are not hurt by that. Tomatoes not affected that. The CRI is such an incredible plant because it creates an instant detritosphere, an instant skin, suppresses weeds, feeds the microbes. It's phenomenal. We are so aesthetic. We're actually mimicking the forest floor. And if you pull the prairie grasses aside and guess what you see, uh, a skin. Another thing that Rick is doing is bringing cattle back into the operation. This is a skill set alone. This is twenty to twenty-five thousand dollar land, folks. When Rick brought cattle back into the operation, people thought he was an idiot. Why would he bring cattle integration back? Weed control. If you have a crop failure, do you know what you call that crop failure? Organic beef. So you're taking another stream. So you, these are safety factors. So you're still making money in case he has a crop failure. This is why I love integration of animals and the cycling that these cows produce. We have done sampling all over. People that have animals in their system are totally notches above those who just do cover crops and no-till. Okay, so why do these guys do it? Why are they doing this? This is right here, folks. Ever since Rick's gone down this journey, he is saving that kind of money every year. Now it's no longer 670,000. It is 800,000 to a million dollars of input a year that he no longer buys. Look at the diesel, the synthetic N, the map, phos the, the potash, phosphorus, the line, the chemistry. Notice it was a gradual thing. I cannot emphasize that. Gradual. I don't know how many times I have to emphasize that. It's a gradual process. But Rick today is saving $800,000 to a million dollars in chemical inputs because he no longer needs them. He is farming. He's mimicking nature. He's utilizing the biology. Okay. If you look at this spreadsheet, if you look at, so remember, he graduated from Purdue. So if you look at Purdue on this column, you look at all the variable costs. This is a spreadsheet, and this is what Purdue Extension, you know, assumes that we'll spend, for example, a typical producer, it will be a 206 bushel. 
and you can see the corn prices are different, but that's the gross income. But here's Rick's with less yield, but look at his gross income, but go all the way down by the time you start subtracting and look at the break even point for, for Rick, 147, and look at the break even for a typical farmer in Indiana, 224 is the breaking point. Rick at Bushels, they're losing money when, when it's all set and you subtract all of this inputs, they're losing money back then. Look at Rick, 147, big, huge difference. Why? I tell people, look, if you do it your way, you pay the tab. If you do it nature's way, she pays the tab. This is what Lane's been teaching about the synergies of biology, okay? So here's just some of Rick's thoughts that I wanna share with you. This is his PowerPoint, by the way. He was gracious to share it with me. Look what he tells people, start easy. Don't get over your head. I tell people, start off with a couple of acres. Learn how to do the covers properly. Uh, do not plant wheat following beans. Some of the key things, know your date, know your date for winter kale species. Beware of hard seed. What does that mean? Be careful with some of these uh, hard seeds because they can become later a weed. You know, careful what you plant out there. Um, and shorten the days of your variety of your corn. Rick tells you, scout your fields. You are going to have to manage more and more intensely. A lot of reasons people can't do this is they're, they're, not, they're really not capable of managing. Regenerative agriculture requires more management. Period. It just does. Don't panic. Collecting good data is critical. You know, he does excessive. Educate your landowner. One, uh, when you put those cover crop mixtures out there, people think they're weeds. You need to educate your producers. You need to, here's one of the things where a lot of people fail. If your cover crops are not as important as your major crop, you're going to fail. They're that critical. You're going to be viewed as an outlier or just a plain liar because people look at you as like, you're insane. What's wrong with you? You are going to be one of the hardest things for regenerative ag is guess what? Social conditioning. The local neighborhood is brutal. Continue the soil test. We're going to talk about that in a second. And I'm going to skip this right here because we don't have time for talking to that. But here's what I want to tell you. This is Rick, he says, good soil data is important. Helps you make good decisions and it gives you a position of strength. Now, and I'm gonna talk about that in a second. I love his attitude. He says, I'm proud to be a farmer, but I'm more proud of the way I farm. That's regenerative stewardship. Now, how did, how did Rick get here? What did, all of us, what are the common pattern I see in all the regenerative farmers? Rick, uh, Gabe Brown, uh, Adam Chapel, all these guys. What's the number one thing I see them? Incredible observation skills. They have learned amazing observation skills. Another thing they're beginning to learn, the plant and soil are one. The moment you separate the plant, you have no biology, no biology, no plant. You have geology. Let's make it very clear. I think we teach soils extremely horribly wrong. You cannot separate. You can't call them soils. Without the plant and microbes, it's geology. Let's just call it what it is. It's geology. This is the most limiting factor throughout the farms. This is what Rick's doing more on his farm. That is a video showing li uh, light energy converted into liquid sun. All these hundreds of compounds feeding these microbes. These, they're changing the system. This is everything. This is the most limiting thing happening through our country. So we can get the biology excited. This is what this is about. The more plants, the more I cover that soil, the more I make this happening. They make nutrients available. They're powerful excretions. It does not happen by itself. And I love this video here because I tell farmers, folks, this video shows 
This is the nutrient cycle, not a fertilizer back. This is soil ecology, all the critters on top. Rick knows this. The more you disturb, the more you till, the more you spray, the more you screw, screw up this elegance. This is what's happening. Rick and the rest of us are learning, and Lane's been teaching this for a long time, the web, the interconnectedness. This is what I missed in my formal education. We forgot the soil ecology. I just want to go out there in the front of a street and scream soil ecology, not soil microbiology, soil ecology, because you take everything on the top and everything on the bottom. It was not taught that. Very frustrating. What, so what is Rick and the rest of us trying to accomplish? Aggregation, the agratosphere, more living plants. This is the completion of the water cycle, folks. If I do not have an aggregate, what's an aggregate? The fusions of the sands and silts and clays create this beautiful porous sphere. This is the completion of the water cycle. We do not have proper aggregation. These aggregates change every 27 days, according to Dr. Six. This is happening globally. We have problems here, folks. We don't have enough living roots in our grazing systems. Rick's doing this integration. Beautiful thing occurring. Without this, we have these ecosystem processes not working. Water cycle, nutrient cycle do not work unless we're here. This is not completion of a functioning grazing system. Very little aggregation is going to be created here because you're taking too much solar panels. It's a huge problem globally. When I walk out there with a shovel and Rick and the rest of us, you know what the first things we observe is these four processes. Are we capturing enough sun? Are we, do we have enough cover? Because if we don't have this, we don't have a functioning water cycle. And then we don't have a functioning nutrient cycle. And you know what I call diversity? I call it the software of the planet. Without organisms, insects, animals, microbes, biology, we would have geology. Your iPhone is worthless. It's a piece of plastic without the software, without diversity on the planet. We live in Mars, Venus. Biology, the most powerful geological force is life, ladies and gentlemen. Look what we are able to do. This is no-till by itself. NRCS promoted no-till all the time. Look how stratified that is. Three years of covers, three years of covers went from this to this on the right. Three years of cover crops. Microbes and plants do it. Look at the respiration increase. Look at the weoc, how much more cycling. Soil health score went up by that much. So going down the path here, what's, so why are we having such a problem? When I walked away as, a, as an agronomist, we did this, tillage. I thought tillage was normal. So I called tillage, tillage side. We over hay, we do too much tillage, we do too much pesticides, we over fertilize. I call it chronic stress. I tell people I have more hope for Chernobyl to heal than our modern agriculture fields. I have more hope for Chernobyl. Why? There's no humans there. So if you want to go look at Chernobyl now, they find radiotrophs that eat radiation. It's healing on itself. Nature is healing itself, but we have chronic stress. Let me give you an example. What Rick is trying to do is lessen the, the tillage, the fungicides, all this, what we're talking about. So if you hurt the mycorrhizae, you hurt the springtails, you hurt the other organisms, and the whole system collapse, and then you write another check. What part do you not get? If you screw this up, you write another check. Look at this. Michael Thompson, a farmer with his own microscope, no-till. Cover crops, grazing. Doesn't this make you just get all, I get goosebumps, Elaine. Look at this. This is what you've been promoting for years. Adam, isn't this beautiful? Yeah, I see Elaine going, yeah, baby. Yeah, now I get it. Now look at no-till without any cover crops and no integration of, of animals. Now, please don't misunderstand. Can you do this without grazing? Yes. You can put compost. You can do compost extracts. You've been in Lane's class, you know how to do that. 
But the, without the cover crops, it's not going to happen. Without cover crops, it is everything. Now look at this. This is also Michael Thompson. Now look at that. Do you guys see anything here? Wait, wait, wait for it. Wait for it. That's it. That's it. That's all you're going to get. That's chronic stress, folks. That's the point. Too much tillage, too much fungicides, too much chemicals. This is why Rick is trying to make this work. Now, what is Rick Clark using as a soil test? I love this from Dr. Buzz Clute. And I, I've never understood this until I, I finally got it. All This came from this concept. All computer models are wrong. Some are useful. All soil tests are wrong. Some are useful. What does that mean? There is no one singular test that will ever tell you the complete elegance of the soil and functionality. But some of these tests are useful, like the one Elaine came up with and the one Dr. Rick Haney, Rick Clark, and all my producers use the Haney test. Why? Number one, reduce inputs. Elaine was already way ahead of that. She had one. This is what screwed us up for 100 years in our schools. This is the model I walked away. Diffusion, mass flow, interception. This is what I learned, the mineral theory. That was partially right. But they forgot the most important thing, the biology. They're the ones that make things soluble and laid it into the solution. It wasn't the water. It wasn't this magic trick. But that's what I walked away thinking. And I took gradual level soil chemistry. Yeah, Ray, you were just a poor student and you ate the book. No, this is the paradigm. And it's led to this. Soil tests that if you cross the border, and I recommend this, go to, uh, there's Magic in the Borders, a YouTube by Dr. Brad Doran. Um, and he said, Purdue, and he created this slide. He said, wait a minute, how come my fertility recommendations are all over the board? If you're in Missouri, it's 260. Now these are values for a two year fertilizer cost for 180 bushel corn and six to bushel soybean. These are values at $1,000 per thousand acres, okay? This one, back up a little bit here, my mouse. In other words, in Missouri, it would cost you $260,000 for a thousand acres. You go here in Illinois, it's 392. They were all over the stinking board, all over. I saw problems with the conventional soil test for the last 15, 20 years. It was a disaster. It measured chemistry, but it did not give you credit for life. Here's the sad thing about it. We've known about some of this research for years. This is a McGruger plot. We knew when you put chemical fertilizer, only 40% of that fertilizer ever reached the plant. 60 was lost. So we're, we're addicted to fertilizers and our soil tests were horribly off. This got pulled off, it's called the Illinois Fertilizer and Chemical Association, did a bunch of cool research in Illinois. And since I started taking, using their data, they also, all of a sudden they pulled it off. I wonder why, but here's, it's interesting. This was, they went all over Illinois and collected data and they said, we're gonna do a zero plot, 50. And so they, all these plots, they did zero plots, 50. They put 50 uh, units, hundred units, 150, et cetera, et cetera. And then they got the yield, very typical. Do you know what the number one thing producers focus on right here? But they never asked the question, how come we got almost a hundred bushel of corn with zero fertilizer? Never asked that. And then here's the number one thing farmers never do. They never put a, a zero check. Do you know what this data means? Worthless. It doesn't tell me nothing because I never put a zero check. Who put the fertilizer there? Was it the microbes or your fertilizer bag? The reason I'm sharing this with you, because it's important because Rick and all of us had to go through this journey. This was a big thing. This is Rick's, what Rick did, he collected all the data points from that. Uh, Rick Kane, he's now retired, ARS professor, uh, researcher. He collected all that data set. And it's interesting from what he found from that Illinois group. 
is that in the zero, in all those plots, it ranged from 50 all the way to 160 bushels of corn with zero fertility, zero. Look at the 300. Even 300 units of N only produce 150. So what did we learn from all these data sets? That one, we were over fertilization. In fact, the more you fertilize, in some cases, because of heavy soils, we were actually diminishing yield. And that we're over fertilizing by about 100 units. We have guys doing close to 200 bushel corn with just 50 units of it. Just 50. That's shocking. So what, is, what do I love about Rick's test? And why Rick Haney, Rick Clark, Dan DeSutter, all the farmers are still using it. Why? Because it's a passive test and it's based on the concept of biomimicry. Wow, we finally had a scientist say, hey, why are we using these very caustic acids? Why don't we use the acids that plants release, release, release for the extractant? We'll talk about that in a second. But here's the biggest problem I have with a lot of people all over the country, whether it's researchers, agronomists, and people in common, just common producers, a lot of us. And it took me years to wrap my mind around this. Do not compare a Lane's test, Haney test with a physical chemical test. It's apples and oranges. You need to come with a biological, ecological framework. Do not compare them. Don't. You'll hurt yourself. Stop it. And that's what we have a lot of researchers that diminish the other tests. They're trying to extrapolate and view Rick's test from a chemical paradigm. No, don't do that. Rick's test is based on these seven perimeters. I don't have time to talk about it, but they're based water extractable carbon respiration. CO2 came from the Russians. The Russians knew the more respiration, the more fertility. Some of the best soil microbiologists were the Russians. Okay, this is the extractant. Rick uses three extractants, the major extractants of roots, acylic, malic, and citric. Acylic, matri well, those three acids. Can't remember right now. But what we were using in the old soil test, sulfuric acid and all these caustic acids, and we were forcing nutrients off the exchange side and they were wrong. We weren't mimicking nature. We were making and forcing the answer. Rick says, no, why don't we use the roots? And another thing Rick did was brilliant. He uses sophisticated water analyzers that picks up the water organic, water soluble organic nitrogen and water soluble organic carbon. These are passive, these are very sophisticated, very ex expensive analyzers. So really the Haney test became like a blood sample. You take the sa soil sample in, they re-wet it, and they pick all these incredible molecules and you get a direct read. It is what it is. That's why doctors love using the blood sample. It tells you a lot about the body. The old chemistry set test told you about nitrate ammonia and that was it, and ammonium. That's it. That's all they talked about. Rick's test picks all that up. We've been missing all the organic molecules. We know now plants can take amino acids. We've known that since the 1930s. We've been missing over 50% of the nitrogen, the organic plea, plea, part. Cannot build organic nitrogen without carbon, folks. So we're using all this. We're getting ready to wrap all this up, folks. We are using all these tests, tissue tests, check strips, water sensors. We are calibrating our own farms. Oh yes, I even use the old test. Maybe I get a cation exchange capacity. I put all these data sets together. We use all of them. And so when you order a Haney test from this lab, you still get the old. This is the only lab I trust to do the Haney test correctly. And, and Rick works with them and it's Lance Gunderson. I will not verify the Haney test for anybody else. I do not get any money back from them. It's my reputation. I am not going to recommend because it's, they're going to say, but Ray, you recommended and we took a yield loss. This test is very conservative. Again, this is what we're mimicking. We're now doing covers this way. 
we'll talk about that. This is what Rick's doing. And because we're out of time, I just want to show you this last thing and we're going to wrap it up. Folks, this is the mixer that we're designing. And people say, well, Ray, how did you guys come up this? this? There was a brilliant scientist. His name is Adam Galagari, came from Brazil. And Gay Brown and Jay Fuhrer came to listen to him and says, and they learned how to design mixes that look like the prairie. And that's what we've done. And this is what happened in 2007. They went and had a plots and they did this plots and it, and it was very dry. After they heard at a mirror, it was just 2006. They only had 1.8 inches of rain. This is the time that we understood that collaboration happens more than con competition. This is the year of 2007 when I took, threw my graduate level weed science book in the trash can. Went to the trash can. Why? This is what happened. We planted, the farmers planted lupin monoculture in one plot, oil seed radish in one plot, monoculture, monoculture. They weighed them and dried them. Now keep in mind, 1.8 inches, really bad year to do test plots. Now they mix the seed here in these plots. Look at the biomass increase. Better to show you than see the data. Turnip, 1.8 inches in the monoculture. Dead oil seed, dead monoculture. Look what happened when we put them together. This is a this is what happened, folks. How in the world with 1.8 inches, if we mix the seed and put five or six seeds together, they did this. But if I just grew one seed by itself, here's the plots, it died. Synergy. Oh, but Ray, where's your research? I love when people throw that in my face. Look at this. I went to go look and said, look at the ecology letters by Mark Burton is from Professor of Biology at Brown. Read it, stress gradient hypothesis. We've known some of these stuff, wrapping it up. When I design a mix, look at Dr. David Tillman. He did some incredible research on the prairies. Notice plant biomass. When we get five species to 15, look at the biomass go up. This is what we emulate it. So when I design a mix, this is what we shoot for. But we also put three functional groups. Look at the biomass go up. And there's functional group is a legume, a broadleaf, a grass, all of them making, mimicking the prairie. Last slide, folks. Last couple of slides. What's the problem? Let's look in the mirror. We're the problem. What changed Rick? He has a different mindset. The top producers in the world have a different way they look at things. They're not a fixed mindset. They have a growth mindset. When they fail, they, don't, they look at setbacks as a thing to overcome. Fixed mindsets. They can't take criticism. They feel threatened. It's a pride issue. They think everything's predetermined. These guys here are totally different. Last slide, promise. Folks, this is what I teach. I teach to have a different mindset, to mimic nature. The biggest problem is us. We're the problem. It's the way we view the world. So if you do not have the right mindset, you're not going to pick the skills. You're not going to listen to the Elaine's. You're not going to take the classes. Learn to take the classes. Learn ecology. Read textbooks. I'm a reader. I read all the time. I read, I read, I read soil ecology textbooks, guys. I don't read little fluffy books. Some are readers. Some are listeners. Whatever it takes. Please understand. Last word, it's not about the cow. It's not about the no-till. It's not about the compost. It's not about tools. It's about understanding and then learning how to use the tools correctly because now you have the proper skill set. I'm done. And you're probably going, good, Ray. But folks, that's the thing. That's what made these producers, all of us went through this journey. 
every one of us had to go through a paradigm shift. And so that's what happened to us. We were failing. Open it up. Thank you, Ray. That, that, oh, that was fantastic. Um, before we get to questions, we're going to do a, a small video about our April promotion. But um, the way you left it around mindset, you know, uh, being in the business and helping farmers do that, that transformation, I couldn't agree with you more. Mindset is just one of the most key, key things. Once you're able to change minds, uh, then the rest of the processes flow. Without the mindset change, it becomes a real, real challenge. So thank you for that. That was, that was fantastic. All right, let me go ahead and uh, share up my screen here. And I think, all right, hold on a second. I'm having a little bit of technical challenge here getting the screen share to go. Give me one second here, folks. All right, I think I got it now. My apologies, there we go. All right, back on track. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, talk about our April promotions before we get into the, the uh, Q and A. And just as a reminder, there is the Q and A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So if you click on the Q and A button, uh, please go ahead and post your questions in there. And we've already got a few questions teed up for our Q and A sessions, but we definitely want to see more. Um, and let's talk about our Springboard Plus offer. So this is our April promotion. And, um, you know, typically the courses, the foundation courses run 5,000. We're offering for the month of April uh, them to be $2,900, which is a total savings of 47%. And this will be the lowest price guaranteed for the year of 2022. So uh, there is a limited amount of spaces that are available. So if you definitely want to sign up, uh, please do so. And we're going to run a short video uh, to go ahead and just uh, talk about the promotion that we're running this year. So let me go ahead and get this started. Spring is in the air and there's never been a better time to launch your career in soil regeneration than right now. With the Springboard Plus offer, you can register for the Soil Food Web Foundation courses for just $2,900 and you'll get two free bonus courses, saving an incredible $2,600 or 47% off the regular fee price. This is guaranteed to be the lowest price through the rest of the year. Whether you're a farmer, rancher, market gardener, or just someone who's passionate about the planet looking for a way to make a big impact, this could be for you. Here's what some of our students are saying about the Soil Food Web training program. I find that this information hasn't been taught to me and I had to get off my high horse. And even though I have a PhD, I feel like I'm totally undertrained. I feel like I'm learning more with this program than I have with in-person classes in the past. I've taken classes on microbiology before, but this course really makes a difference in the way that a story is put together that unveils the relationships between plants and all those beneficial organisms that we just cannot see without a microscope. If you're looking for something that does a deep dive into soil biology, this is it. It is just an incredible knowledge base and is really relevant to what's going on right now in the world. Without it, the only way I could have gained this knowledge would have been by dropping my life and going to graduate school. And that just wasn't realistic for me. But Soil Food Web has made it possible for me to build a meaningful career in land restoration. I was really nervous. I was gonna put quite a bit of money down and not get that bang for my buck. But once I actually got into the FC courses, I was incredibly impressed with how professional they are, and actually the level of education you receive. This is the career path I've been looking for in the biological community, and I was having trouble finding. Remember, with the Springboard Plus offer, you're not only getting the foundation courses for $2,900, but you're also getting these two free bonus courses. The Introduction to Permaculture is an 18 lecture course that covers a wide array of permaculture principles and themes delivered by Graham Bell, Chair of Permaculture Scotland and longest serving permaculture teacher in the UK with 31 years experience teaching on six continents. Permaculture is a regenerative design approach that can be applied to just about anything from water management, growing systems, dwellings, and much more. The Soil Sponge Regeneration Workshop is delivered by educator and author Dee Dee Persaus. 
This five session course is all about regenerating the soil sponge for flood, drought, and wildfire resilience. It builds on the successes of innovative land managers around the world who are saving huge sums and damages from extreme weather events and crop diseases while restoring the dignity and profitability of farming. DD teaches participatory workshops both in person and online, helping to show the nested relationships between soil health, human health, water cycles, and climate resiliency. Sign up for these amazing courses and join the soil revolution today. Spring is in the air. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and move on to our Q&A session. So for panelists, if you wanna go ahead and take yourselves off of mute, we're gonna jump right into our first question. So the first question that hey, we have- Hey, Brian. Yeah, sure, Ray. Brian, yeah, before, before we start, I, I, I do wanna say this. Look, if, if I had to do it again, I would have not gone to graduate school, but I would have taken Elaine's class. It would have been more helpful and given me more context. And so it's unfortunate, but it's true. And so before you go spend all that money in graduate school, it would have been better just taking it. When people look at $2,900 and they freak out. I said, do you know how much graduate school costs? And how much time? So, uh, and, and Lane's not paying me, by the way. Lane's not giving me cash under the thing and doing a little, no, but I'm just giving you, I wish that most pe more people would do that. So I want to thank you for guys for having that course. No, and I hear that too. I work with a lot of agronomists and when we go through and start to talk about soil biology, and I usually tend to go through kind of a, a primer and a little bit of an education with my clients and the agronomists will tend no. to, to attend. They're just blown away. They're like, I never learned any of this stuff in school. And it just, no. it's, it's kind of sad that um, our university systems haven't quite, quite caught up. Now, I know there's some changes. Some of the universities are really starting to look at this and say, hey, this is something we have to pay attention to. But uh, Elaine, <laughs> you've yeah. been fighting this good fight for quite a long time. So, <laughs> and, and if the university, is, yeah, and it, and if you do teach that, and if you do teach it, if you are there, you are an anomaly, and you're occluded in land grants. You you're treated kind of very bizarrely, like like I used to treat organic people when they came into my office. I didn't know what to do with you. So, but <laughs> right. that's the reality of it. Yep. Sure. Sure. Okay, our first question is from Jay. And Jay asks, what does a conversation sound like with a new conventional farmer, like a pecan or vegetable grower, who needs to think about converting to a regenerative practices, especially in drought areas like New Mexico? All right, Ben, let's go yep. say. Okay, I grew up in New Mexico. So I know the very, how dry it is. And if you don't have no water, you don't have no life. You know how that conversation starts? With a shovel. I take a shovel and the first thing I do with that shovel, I walk to the edge of the row to if there's a prairie grass or a tree or something that has not been disturbed for a long time, grab a huge chunk and you'll see it dark aggregated has not been tilled. And then I take his field and it's four or five shades lighter, no aggregation. I said, this is nature's way. This is your way. That's the way the conversation starts. And then I take an infiltration ring and I also take a salsal jar. A salsal jar that, and I have a screen and I drop a clod into the water. Where he's farming, it explodes. And where it's, when I took it from the grass strip or where the weeds are, where it has not been tilled in that, it's well aggregated, it starts and it holds together. Those are the three things that I use. Then I got their attention right away. Within 10 minutes, I can have a conversation with him doing cover crops and mimicking nature with just a shovel and these little tools. That's how the conversation starts. But you better know what you're talking about because he's going to eat your lunch. <laughs> you better have some biology background and already have Elaine's class and you've already been a practitioner because once you get him stirred up, be careful. Careful with your knowledge. It can be very dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Uh, Go ahead, Adam. Ray, I absolutely loved your whole presentation and your response to this first question, you know, because two things that I was tying together in my head were you brought up quantum physics and then you brought up this mm -hmm. mindset shift. And right there, we see it that you found some easy to use demonstrations that can shift someone out of their thinking where they're in some kind of rigid Newtonian physics 
inertia, laws of thermodynamics kind of mindset into something where they go, oh, there's some wonder here. There's something to be in awe of here in this living soil. And, you know, I think that the consequences of learning about quantum physics is you start to say, there is not a separation between the things I'm seeing in the world, the other people and nature and me. Uh, we can either look at things as an it, like battery cage chickens, we can say they're just it's, they're just little sacks of meat, or we can start to look at things as an us, as a community that we're connected to. And it sounds to me like when you get those two soil samples, they see soil that's been treated like an it, and soil that has been in community, in the soil food web, with whoever is managing that land, so that we start to approach these things with a, it's it's us and the microbes. It's me and the life in the soil, not me against it, not me trying to beat and kill a pathogen every day yeah. or a weed every day. And that mindset shift is everything. If we can figure out how to do that with 80% of the population, we're going to live in a regenerative world. Yep. Boy, Elaine, I like him. Yeah. He'd be yeah. Good by getting him. Boy. <laughs> See why we hired him? <laughs> oh, oh, Adam, you're just beautiful. So we, what we've been trying to do is get enough examples of case studies where um, here's the system modified specifically for the conditions that, um, you know, New Mexico, Connecticut, Sri Lanka, um, you know, the Hawaiian Islands, you know, no matter, no matter where we are in the, on the planet, uh, to get them to understand that this is going to cost them a lot less money. The transition needs, you know, there's going to be some input in there. But even in the first year of transition in dairy farms, for example, we keep $200,000 in, in the dairyman's pocket instead of having to spend it on uh, veterinarians and irrigation and um, pesticides and inorganic fertilizers and herbicides instead of that, and also counted in the reduction in the number of times they had to be driving over their pastures, their paddocks, to put in all of these toxic chemicals to try to control um, all of the things they've been told they have to control, and instead start using the biological system where something that they've always called a weed is not a weed. It's a plant that belongs mm -hmm. at this stage of succession. Um, understanding that whole system and where we want to get to. We, we don't want to start growing a forest. We want to grow pasture. But you better have nitrogen fixing um, or um, plants in that system. You better have the nitrogen fixing bacteria in there. And they are different for... Um, well, I'm getting sp too specific here. I always do. Um, so we reduce their um, costs by $200,000 in the first growing season on 300 acres. Some of those growers, some of those dairy people had um, um, land that was way over um, 300 hectares, um, you know, lots and uh, uh, much larger herds. So we need to set that information in front of the group of people that we're talking to and make certain that they understand here's the result of starting to work with nature instead of fighting her <laughs> in the long term. If we continue fighting Mother Nature, who's going to win? Mother Nature. And if we're behaving badly, Mother Nature is going to say, we don't need you. Whereas if we work with, and help develop the system so that we can all live good productive lives um, we won't be excluded from whatever's coming next i agree you know, i want to say one thing uh, i want to say one thing real quick about it. lane you know what you taught me ecological and biological context i think that was so critical that's why i was able to get that shovel you see and i'm telling you a lot of producers don't even carry a shovel most practitioners don't even carry a shovel. The shovel gives you context. Where are you at? 
where are you at in your system, in your ecosystem? How and deep that's are your roots fail. going? Yeah. Do you have any yep. moisture still left? Because it's building structure that allows water to be held in the soil. No organic matter. How can you hold water? Organic matter holds 10 times its weight in water. So you better have the bacteria and the fungi working together. And you can show that so elegantly, as you just described, with a shovel. Walk over here, see what an undisturbed system actually should be. Here's what you've been doing. You've been following the Nukem approach to life, which is just so totally bizarre. You're yep. supposed to kill and everything in order to live. And the, yeah. one of the things that I saw right away is those little BBs, aggregates. They're so critical. I, I, we talk a lot about the darkness of the soil. That's cool. Aggregates, they are so critical for infiltration, porosity. You know, you got to think about, and we'll say this, I know that Brian wants to get the next one, but think about carbon in the soil. It's not only in the liquid phase, in the gas, and solid at the same time. Mm -hmm. Whoa. And then you want to pay people for that? Really? That's why I have such a hard time paying people for carbon. That's a different story, but we better. Well, one thing I, I just wanted to add before we move on to the next question, and I think, uh, Ray, your, your mic might cut out. Oh, yeah, you went on, on to mute. Um, is that one of the things I find when I'm working with new clients in particular is that, you know, there's a, a general lack of knowledge around the biological systems. And we have to provide knowledge uh, to the farmers so that they themselves feel empowered to make decisions. And not only with that, is they also usually have a team of people that they work with, agronomists, irrigation specialists, you know, the PCAs and so forth. And I find it's very important to bring those folks into the conversation as well, so that there's a, a level set, a grounding knowledge of what the biological systems are going to do. Because one of the things I like to do after I kind of we talk about this base biology knowledge is then to go into and, and review the management practices that the farmers are doing. And I like to categorize them into three things. Is that management practice harming biology, soil biology, or the soil ecosystem? Is it neutral or is it beneficial? And what we want to do is prioritize all of those management practices that are in that harmful category and find alternatives to move them either to neutrals or beneficials. And then you just kind of work through that process with them. And that helps us set kind of a plan that, that we can, you know, work through to, to help us through that, that transition, you know, period. So I, I find that it's communication and knowledge. And the one last thing I, I would say is that I also try to recommend doing a trial. Um, and a trial is not just to show the farmer that, yeah, it works, that we can actually move that, that land. I find it's more important that during that trial, they themselves understand at a small scale what that transition is going to look like. How can they at a small scale understand those management practice changes and then figure out how to do that on a large scale in the rest of their operation? So, so for me, it's, it's, it's knowledge is the start. And once we're there, good communication and then the rest can flow. Well, Brian, I have to use, I have to use shock and awe. <laughs> I, don't, I only got a couple of minutes. You know what I do? I use my soil demonstrations. Sure. And agronomists are hard to teach. Educated yeah. people in their field are the worst. Agreed. And I love that little video when you said about that person, PhD, I got off my high horse. One of the most things to limit knowledge is arrogance, intellectual mm -hmm. arrogance. So I have to use shock and awe. I have to use those demonstrations yes. to absolutely destroy everything they think they know. Then I can talk to them. Brian, you have people coming to you because they want to learn. Yes. How about people, yeah. how about agronomists that don't want to be there? Right. Oh, yeah. And which the challenge I run into is I'll have the farmers that are looking and saying, hey, I'm very interested in moving down this road. It's some of the people surrounding them that are the headwinds that you have to come across. I've had agronomists basically say everything you just said is garbage and literally just kind of walk away from the conversation. Those are difficult things. I, I, I do appreciate it. I love the test that you do, Ray, because it, it does the, the visual impact of some of those tests that, that you, you go through is fantastic because you know, a picture is worth a thousand words or a video is worth a million words, right? Or it, being able to experience it. Um, so yeah, I agree. I, I'd love to take more of your, your uh, examples and the things that you do uh, to be able to do that kind of shock and awe because I agree with you. I think it, it is so important to do something like that. Okay, uh, let's move to the next question. Uh, the next question is from Alex. And the question is, I've heard it been said that nutrients are high within soil, but often does not transfer to crops. 
Why is that? How can we enhance the soil to produce nutrient dense soil without the use of fertilizer? Okay, panelists, what say you? Well, there's a massive amount of nutrient in your soil. If you just do total assessments, you would be shocked by the level of calcium and magnesium and sodium and potassium, uh, phosphorus. I got a question uh, yesterday that said, well, um, I've been told I have no phosphorus in my soil. And so how, how do I get it back? And I'm just like, no, no, you, you got plenty of phosphorus. It's just not in a plant available form. So you got to be kind of careful when you're talking to um, soil chemistry people, because they don't tell you which of the major pools they're talking about. Most of the time when you get uh, um, uh, uh, something from the lab, uh, a report from the lab, yay, remember the word, report from the laboratory, the only thing you're told about is the soluble nutrients, or maybe if you're lucky, you get the exchangeable nutrients. Most of the time, exchangeable when we're looking at base saturation. But the rest of it is just um, um, soluble. Well, what happened to the total pool? There's all the nutrient sitting waiting for the plant to tell the bacteria and fungi which of those nutrients it wants today. And the bacteria and fungi then use that food from the uh, root system to make the enzymes to pull those nutrients from the silica bilayer of the sand, the silt, the clay. And I don't think any of you have run out of sand, silt, and clay in your soil. Um, where did the sand, silt, clay come from? Well, as the bacteria and fungi happily chewed away on the rocks and the uh, parent material and the boulders, et cetera, that's what releases those different size portions of the parent material. So you're making uh, that soluble material is now inside, well, actually it's organic um, nutrients inside the bacteria and the fungi, and they have to be eaten by the protozoa and the nematodes and microarthropods in order to release those nutrients in a plant available form. And your plant, of course, is right there because the plant put the food out there to grow the bacteria and fungi. They're right around the root system. Uh, protozoa and nematodes, they move into the root system and release those nutrients because the concentration of nutrients inside the bacteria and the fungi is so much greater than what's the protozoa or the nematodes or the microarthropods or the earthworms or the incotreids, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So much more than those organisms can tolerate that they poop it out. There's your poop loop. Um, so we don't really have to worry about most of those nutrients in the soil. We've got excess amounts. On an annual basis, those nutrients are going to be replenished in your soil because those empty exchange sites, if you will, or the empty sites in the silica bilayer are going to be grabbed, chemically speaking, as they go by the um, material in your soil. As long as you've got good structure, everything will be replenished. So you're not ever going to run out of nutrients. Think about you know, sequoia trees or redwood trees in California, where they've been growing in the same place for the last 2000 years. And they're not dying. There are more nutrients taken up from that soil and stored in the uh, woody material of those giant trees than any crop you want to talk about being harvested and pulling the sellable part of that um, plant material to someone else. So replenishment from your own groundwater is really important. And if you're downhill from somebody who is putting on inorganic fertilizers, you're getting excess, huge excess amounts coming through your system. Why not grab some of that and keep it so you can grow your plants? So that's awesome. the difference. Yeah. You've got soluble versus exchangeable versus total. And make sure you understand what portion of the chemical pool um, your chemistry person is talking about. I just want to add one statement to she did it eloquently. I just want to say, you know, what's the limiting, limiting nutrient is liquid sun carbon. So everything that Elaine's talking about, 
they're the ones that make it available. And I, and I talk to a lot of agronomists a lot, and you do, Brian, all of you guys have talked about it. You know what the problem is? They, they think of the soil like this, this chemistry set, and they also think of it's a bank account. Oh, you got to put maintenance back, blah, blah, blah. Totally wrong. It's a dynamic ecosystem. I want to just make this last statement. Folks, when you see that corn or you see that huge sequoia tree that she's talking about, that Lane was talking about, that's a 3.41 million pound tree. 95% is air and carbon and water. Very little comes from the soil, less than 5%. That's why it's in parts per million. That, so when you're harvesting that crop, you're harvesting air. Magic trick, did not know that. Most of it's air, guys. So I think we, we I, I wish I would have been taught that. It's mostly air, carbon, sugars, carbohydrates, cellulose, all that carbon, we're carbon. So which, thank you, Lane, for bringing that up. Which keeps all of that above ground part of the plant aerobic. Everything going on in the, that plant is, has to be aerobic. Roots are obligately aerobic. Um, anaerobic conditions don't help that plant out, except under very special conditions. You got, you got um, turned off. I couldn't hear the last couple of comments you made, Ray, because I think you turned on your um, mute button. Oh, sorry. I just, I, I just wanted to wrap that up. And I just said, you know what I was thinking, folks? It's like, as a, uh, we had just a really bad concept it's not a little bank account. It's not mass flow. You know, mass, you take this much here, this mass you remove. It's much more elegant than that. And I think you took care of that, Elaine. So I just think we just missed the mark a lot about nutrient. Yeah. It's a, you know, the green revolution was one of the worst pathways we've ever gone down as a species. We got to back up and understand how um, poorly um, the conclusions were. Agreed. Well, and that's the only thing I would add to, you know, this question answer session, because I just have loved sitting here and listening to the two of you explain this very well. Um, my friends who are conventional ag producers are very skeptical of the kinds of things that we're saying because of that mindset that we're dealing with. And the thing that starts to be a wrench in that whole machine to me is saying, but what about the lessons of COVID that these long supply chains connected all over the world, even for consumer goods, broke down? They were so fragile. We didn't have this local supply chain of inputs that was resilient against, you know, at least one region might be able to figure out how to keep something going, even if another region falls in hard times, right? But we've globalized the whole thing and we're all dependent on phosphorus that's coming out of Morocco to keep the world fed, right? Because of this chemical, or what do you call it, the mineral paradigm system, where we know that the phosphorus that's being mined out of Morocco, which is not a democracy, by the way, <laughs> is going around the world on ships, being dumped onto our farms, and really rapidly, it's becoming occluded or it's becoming unavailable to plants in the soil. So we're not even building up this bank account of fertility over time we're just changing things chemically and so all that phosphorus is stuck or that nitrogen and phosphorus is getting into water supplies and causing huge issues downstream and to the point where it's affecting our ability to fish natural fisheries um, in the gulf so then we're decreasing global food um, security because of the way that we're fertilizing cornfields in iowa right yeah. and it's just like the status quo isn't going to work. The next 30 years of human history is going to require us to be brave and make these changes or else our society is going to collapse. I mean, I'm not a pessimist. I think we can do it. But I think we've got to shift some mindsets very rapidly in order to have something left to save. Right. And, you know, the farmers themselves are looking at, you know, their resiliency you know, in these supply chain issues, in the way the climate's changing, you know, regenerative agriculture is equal resilient agriculture. And, you know, looking at how we can build these resilient systems, I think farmers are very, very keyed into wanting to have that, especially because they've been taking so many hits so frequently now. Um, it's such an important thing. And, and I could tell you the amount of interest of farmers looking to get into regenerative agriculture, and Ray, you probably experienced this, is just accelerating exponentially. 
because they're running into so many challenges. They're saying there's got to be a different way. It, that graph that you showed about the income versus the input costs. Oh yeah, a lot of my farmers are very well aware of that. <laughs> they look at their bank accounts and say, uh, yeah, I'm getting killed on all, all, all sides of this. I need a, a different way to be able to get out of this trap. Okay, uh, let's move on to a next question. And pull this up here. Uh, the next question is from Gerald. And speaking of headwinds that farmers uh, run into, uh, this question is, how can I convince my banker this is the way to proceed in farming when he also caters to the fertilizer and chemical companies? Where can I find a more understanding banker? Well, say hopefully, you. hopefully you don't need one because really we're, not, we're just asking you to switch to buy, buying a good compost. Okay, that can be a little bit fun to find in certain, in a lot of places, but then you can make your own compost as well. And you could start out fairly, fairly small uh, as we've been su su suggesting, you know, uh, one acre, 10 acres, 50 acres, something like that, to learn the procedures, to see how it works. And while you're learning from that test, you would want to be making compost or hiring somebody to come out and start a company that makes the compost. We always work with indigenous organisms, so you're not hitting the problems with um, crossing uh, state lines or international borders or something and trying to take your foreign microorganisms into a place where maybe they don't exist. So we work with developing those indigenous organisms. So there's no problem in, with you applying them to your ecosystem. Um, so, you know, as we were saying just before, um, if you can be saving $200,000 per 300 acres, I think I said hectares, but it's acres, uh, of land, then uh, you're, you're managing to foot the bill for the larger conversion into making a significantly greater amount of compost to supply the microorganisms. You've got to have the right balances, and that's what we teach you. Uh, one of the things I'm going to talk about, I had a farmer come up to me is, after one of my classes that's Ray, you don't understand. I'm still, I can't even afford a cover crop. That's how poor he was. I mean, he was right at the edge. A lot of these producers are right at the edge. And I said, look, I said, don't put any potassium, don't put any phosphorus, but I want you to put a cover crop. I said, you eat every day, don't you? I said, the soil eats through a living plant. The ancient people used to call it the mouth of the soil. I cannot get it to cycle. Can I get it? The phosphorus will be there. The potassium will be there. Cover crops are not optional. They are not optional. You don't, and I said, so you got 20 or $30 an acre on the cover crop by the time you fill your tractor and everything. Eventually you take a small and start doing this. The first thing I get farmers to do is do a cover crop. Nothing heals faster than a plant healing the soil ecosystem is quick. And then, okay, so I get them to do that first. Pick some small acres. You don't need the banker to do this. You've got enough space to be able to do that. Once you start seeing that and then get part of a community that are doing this, do not do this by yourself. Uh, the Australians, the people from Mexico, they don't have government help. They don't have cost share. They don't have any of that. So what I'm telling people now is go look for on YouTube, look, build a, be part of a community. And then you start calibrating your, your soils, start calibrating your soils. In other words, zero check, half rate, full rate check, and start putting the covers. Then you can start slowly weaning yourself from, from, this, from the system. And I, and I also see some empowerment going on in the future. And this is my producers that are further ahead of using the compost extracts like Lane's talking about and some of these other things so we can get them cycling quicker. But I baby steps, let them do the cover crop first and do it religiously. Last statement, I went and spoke in front of 200 producers, 200. And these are producers that have been doing no-till, some covers, and, they're, and they came to Dave Brand's field day. I asked him one question. How many of you are doing cover crops religiously? 
In other words, you get the corn out, cover. You get the soybean, cover. You never leave the ground bare. Do you know, unfortunately, only less than 10%, we're most, uh, only 90% were not doing it religiously. If you can't even get there, I can't get you any further, guys. And so what I'm teaching you here is agroecology. You don't need the banker. You need to build and come to a class, whether I teach it or Elaine, but I'll teach you the logistics, how to back off. So the thing of is be exposed so you don't need the banker. Eventually you're gonna be free from the banker and from the government, but you have to go down this journey slowly. We yeah. tend to use um, perennial covers. So we only have to buy seed once we get that perennial cover beneath everything. And that serves the same purpose as the cover crop. It's just that we, we don't have to go in and mow it or you know um, compress it down. Um, we can plant a, a furrow with the seeds of the crop going in. And we want to remove uh, that portion of the cover plants who have grown over the uh, the furrow, we want to be removing that biomass and uh, throwing it out into the um, area that is not being tilled up. So you're only tilling the furrow. And it doesn't take very long for those um, sets of organisms um, right close to the furrow to return to that soil that's been disturbed. So we can rely on the microorganisms to come back in those very small places and not um, go through and disturb all of that soil. So I think that might be another um, yeah. consideration. And it's a good one. I, I love the perennial idea. And the reason I don't promote it too much in the large scale, because I, I believe what you said, Elaine, because that's the best. The problem is we don't have enough. We're having problems even with regular seed. And, and these permanent perennial grasses are $200 an acre. They're very, very costly. Mm -hmm. But ultimately you want to get to the point where Elaine gets, but I have guys, that's why I use the crops like cereal rye and those kind of annuals. That's the reason we start them off. And then the soils are so degraded. I used to design perennial mixes for the range, but the soils were so bacteria driven that it takes a long time for the establishment and we need more of a balanced soil. So I use the annuals so that we can plant our perennials because our perennials aren't ready because we used to plant perennials in the bacteria dominant system, Elaine, and they would fail on us. We had a lot of massive failure. And I like using the mixes to even start doing our perennials because we had failures on it. And so we get more of a balance. So both of them, the, both of these technologies will be very helpful. Did you have adequate fungi in the compost that you were putting on or the extracts and the teas? Your fungal no, biomass? Right. I, I didn't do that because we're, I, and let's make this clear if I so the whole audience knows. Guys, I'm dealing with guys with thousands of acres, hundreds of acres. Let's, uh, let's talk about scale. And if you're in a smaller scale, I like what Elaine was talking about. And because if I'm, if I'm doing with the Rick Clarks, it's too much. I don't, they don't have, uh, you have to get a lot of compost up to the, up to the point. The logistics is brutal. Uh, uh, the seeding. So, I deal with big producers and people with smaller, you know, from acres. I love the, again, you have to look at scale and a scalability, but eventually I would love to see that. And I think that takes, um, you know, like everybody listening to this, to this morning, if you want a different career, start making compost in a place where we already have one or two people established using the biological mm -hmm. approach, because yeah. there's your proof it works. Now, you know, get out to all the grower meetings, all the, you know, the shows where they have big equipment and everything. Get out there and be advertising, going back, yep. you know, telling them they can go see field days where it is working and get this movement started. We need people who will uh, uh, be making and selling really good biologically complete compost is what we talk about. Um, label it our yep. bio complete compost yeah we find you know what i oh, go ahead ray go ahead brian i just want to say this real quick look guys i really see a like elaine's talking about a big market for 
biosignaling material like coating the seed with biology, put it in the in the furrow with a with a sprayer, and also put it on the pivot. I think that's really going to be huge because once we have the farmer doing the no-till on the covers and then spraying this material to get incredible nutrient cycling faster, I think it's the future. I really do. And it's going to take people with really good skill set. Because I'm going to tell you, a majority of farmers are not going to do it. They're just not. And you've got to do it right. You're not going to get the results. And then you're going to get blowback in your face. And, and that's where we're at. So I, I see a big future for this, Elaine. And you got to be good at what you do. And just putting the material on the top of the surface, there's not enough carbon in the planet. You'll have to knock all the forest down. But the microorganisms, that's where I see this biosignaling really taking off. Yeah. You know, we're getting success at large scale um, when we are using very high quality biocomplete compost. And it really, you're using it as an inoculum. You know, it is the ability to put it into a liquid form that is going to allow us to get to that large scale acreage that's out there. Um, and, you know, for me, the work I do, the limiting factor I have is finding good biologically complete compost. Um, it just simply is that. And I'm lucky that in California, where I have a lot of my clients, um, I do have a number of biocomplete producers. People are making good uh, compost that my, my um, farmers are buying from, and we're making great extracts and teas and so forth to be able to do that work. And like Elaine said, we really do need to get more producers out there making a very high quality. Because you can look at a compost in a very high uh, quality, biologically complete compost will have hundreds, if not thousands of times more biological biomass that's important for us to use than some of the stuff that's coming out of municipal waste facilities. Um, and if you're trying to make good extracts or teas from stuff that's coming from very poorly made compost, you're gonna struggle. You just will not have the amount of biology you need to be able to make that change. And it's, and the one last thing I was gonna say, it's not just also the biomass, it's also the diversity. That's the key thing too. If you don't have the diversity in that, that compost, you're still gonna struggle you know, to, to get that nutrient cycling to work. Sorry, then I cut you off. Oh, well, I was just going to bring up exactly the same thing, <laughs> that diversity is really important here because every summer is different. Every fall is different. Every springtime, you know, you've got to have this massive diversity within that compost material, diversity of indigenous organisms that will tolerate your climate conditions. They don't care if it gets to be minus 80 they don't care if it's going to get to 110. They, they've already lived to it. There are species that are working and functioning as long as you're getting all of that indigenous sets of microorganisms. And the best place to get it is from your all this mixture of um, habitats and ecosystems that are present close by near to you. Good guy organisms. And we certainly help people understand exactly how to go out and harvest that. We're the epitome of going local, really. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't want to be buying compost from Florida and then move it out to California and trying to let those organisms, you know, do the work. Yeah. All right. I see. Let's do one more question uh, before we, we cut this off. I know that we're we're almost at the time, but I feel like hey, we got one more in us if we can do it. So uh, let's take a look here at our next question, and this one's from Gene. And Gene's question is, the local NRCS district conservationist suggested that no-till and multi-species cover crops for improving soil health may not be enough unless the carbon concentration in the soil is at least 3%, and the local fields have lower values. What are the most cost-effective conservation practices to increase the carbon concentration in soils? And what is the best way to convince the producers to adopt those practices? Leaving a field fallow will not be an option. T. So would say Tea compost tea <laughs> yep what, what we were just talking about and one of the things i always say this word context 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 that's a very dangerous statement about percent organic matter give me give me let me give you an example a lot of people get so enamored with organic matter and i think they lose perspective we've had soils that are 30 percent peat soils organic matter and nothing's alive on it Nothing will grow. It's about biologically active carbon. We got to understand that it, organic matter is important. It's cool. It's the house. But how about the grocery store? Who cares if you live in a 5,000 square foot home 
If you're eating hot dogs every day, life sucks. You've got, it, it's much more than just organic matter in this material. People misunderstand organic matter anyway. Who, you know, we've known by the scientists that 60% of, of organic matter is dead carcasses of bacteria. They're finding all kinds of cool steel. But my point is you have to be careful with those statements. Let me give you an example, New Mexico. You can have a high functioning soil where David Johnson's at and we're good friends that are 2% organic matter. Careful with those statements because what 8% is in the Midwest and 2% in, 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 in New Mexico, total different environment. We have to be careful with those statements and say, oh, we can't only do that. Context, always understand the ecological context. And, and so to make those statements, I'm always just back off, back off. You're not, you're not putting things into context. And then Dr. David Johnson's work has shown once these soils reach an equilibrium for their ecological context, they start to respire less. They, be, they reach this beautiful equilibrium. So I, I just very cautious about those kind of statements about biology and how it can, it can embarrass you. Uh, so that's just a comment about that, that statement. So what can we do as a practice? I'm always going to go, folks, look, and that district conservationist should have known we have soils. Remember I told you about Ray Stires? Ray Stires, his forest was 3%. His was 6%. Roll in the covers. That's all he used. A little bit of manure, covers, and look where he's at. I think we make it too hard. I just think we make it too hard. Mm-hmm. Well, when people try to apply rules that um, fit every place. You know, you have to have at least 3%. Well, yeah, it's, you know, you're, if you're at 2%, let's work on getting you to 3% as rapidly as possible by whatever means. Um, and so compost or extracts or teas, or it's, you know, even less expensive to put out um, cover plants and uh, have that residue. Um, we always like to emphasize that uh, when you put residues down onto the soil surface, in the late fall at harvest time, and you're gonna you're in a part of the world that gets snow, you should have all of that organic matter completely decomposed by the time the snow melts. So all of that addition of new organic matter into the soil, you're above three percent by this time. So it doesn't take very long to get that organic matter back into the soil as long as you've got the cover plants in the system, whether they're perennial or annual, um, we've got to get that organic matter into the soil to make things a bit easier for your bacteria and fungi to function properly. I just want to add to the question. I just want to add real quick before Adam says something. Look, Arkansas, let me give you a perspective. Arkansas, sandy soils, 60 inches of rain. Sandy soils. Those soils are cycling like crazy, low organic matter, no-till cover crops. You trip in that field, it'll decompose you. (laughs) And so what I'm saying is it's humid. It doesn't get cold, guys. Those microbes are cycling all year around. Context. Careful how we make these statements about uh, and, and these other people that were talking like that, district conservationists, it's like, careful. There are patterns and there's principles and I still stick to them. But you got to remember your ecological context, where you're at and when you're making those statements. So I have fields that will cycle so quickly that you can't build one or two per, 2% organic matter. It's not happening. It doesn't mean they're not functioning. Uh, Yeah, I really, I love this conversation. Um, I'm always like the cheerleader here in the room. I want to jump up and down um, when I hear the two of you talk. What the pattern that I'm seeing like one step back as I'm listening is we have some different tools that we have found as we've worked with farmers all over the world. Ray, you found tools. Elaine, you found tools, things that can help people um, in different contexts. The thing that's the scale question is really interesting to me. And and we had Adam York on here in January who has managed to scale biological um, focused, you know, farming techniques up to 100,000 acres in Illinois. So, you know, there's there's some scalability here in teas and and the use of composts. 
But to me, it all comes back to this thing where, and, and we've danced around this with um, university systems, um, government agencies, you know, other groups that are out there. There's this concept in, I talked about it last time, if you've got an arch, everything is important, all the stones that go into the arch, but the most important thing is the keystone. It's holding that arch together. And if you've got anybody suggesting, here's a tool you can use to solve all these problems on your farm, but they haven't conceptualized of how that tool will influence the soil food web, then they are not putting the soil food web at the keystone and the arch is going to fall down, right? All of these other things are important, but the driver is the soil food web. And so this is where I'm so excited that with our region summit, with these webinars, we're pulling in people who see all of these different pieces who have who have developed, you know, cover crops or um, John Kempf with some of his work to maximize the photosynthetic potential of plants. All of it's important. Let's pull it all in and get these farms transitioning as rapidly as possible, as long as the soil food web is the keystone of the structure that we're building. Um, that's the only sustainable path forward for humanity. I wanted to make a last statement because I know we're going to get over, but I just might make one more statement before Adam and everybody gets off. Look, folks, I've come to this realization. If I said you only have one practice throughout the globe you can use, only one practice, what would it be? And I asked that to Rick Clark, and Rick thought about it, and he thought about it. And, it, and I said it would be a living plant. 38% of our planet is bare now, folks. What regulates, we cannot have climate without living plants. And when I say plants, I also think of the microbes. I do not separate them out. I looked at them as a collective whole. And, I, and so what I've learned after all the bureaucracy, all my travel, everything, I've come to this very basic thing. If we're gonna get a climatic change very, very quickly, and what I'm looking for before I become room temperature eaten by the microbes, if I can get, if we can get 50 million acres covered with plants, cover plant, cover crops, we can affect the climate. There was a recent article written called uh, by the Scientific American about water vapor. What we have here globally going on is we have a, too much water vapor, which is a bigger gas than CO2, and you can only bring it down with a plant. I want the CO2 and the water vapor in the soil and the plant. We have an imbalance. And so if we make our message very clear is put living plants and then all the stuff that you guys are teaching the biology and the compost, we need that. So I think that's the real green revolution, cover the planet. So I just thank you Lee for having me. And I appreciate that, Brian and Adam. You guys were awesome. Thank you for having me there. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a great note to uh, to conclude our webinar with. But I, I do want to just go ahead and do a little bit of housekeeping before we close and say our thank yous. Uh, just to remind everybody that we have the Springboard Plus offer happening right now. Again, that was uh, the promotion that we're doing for April. And again, this is going to be our lowest price that we think we're going to offer for the 2022. And um, I also want to promote out our uh, webinar series. We have one more webinar for this webinar series, which is webinar four, uh, Careers in Soil Regeneration. It's going to happen at 11 a.m. Pacific on Wednesday, April 27th. And so we hope to, to see you folks there. And again, all of the webinars that we've had uh, in the month of April, as well as our January webinar series, are all available online for you to go ahead and rewatch. So if you missed any of those or want to go back and take a, a listen to them, uh, please feel free to do so. Okay, at this point, I'd like to thank um, all the folks behind the scenes that, that help make these webinars successful. We have a team of people that uh, do the promotions, do all the, the technology to, to make these things sing. So I wanna thank um, all the Soulful Web staff for, for putting together a, webinar, uh, a wonderful webinar series for us. And I also like to thank our panelists for today. So Ray, uh, man, it was just great hearing from you. Uh, you're, you're so energetic and you're so passionate about what you do. It really translates. And um, I know that you inspired quite a few people just listening on the chat. Uh, you know, everybody's walking away with a, a, a good charge of energy and a, yes, we can do this. Um, Adam, uh, fantastic for you to, to be able to share your, your perspective. I love the way that you, you kind of intersect the society and the culture and the, uh, and the, and the science and, and putting it together. And Elaine, uh, you are the reason why most of us are here. 
um, you know, you inspire us all to do the great work. So thank you very much. It, it's been fun. Thank you, Lane. <laughs> At thank this you, point, Ray. Yeah, <laughs> thank you all. Uh, at this point, we're going to go ahead and conclude this webinar. So see you folks out there. Yep. Take care. Enjoy. Well, I hope, Don't hope forget to click well. that like button, subscribe yep, that, to our uh, channel, and ring the notification bell to stay updated with all our new videos. Mm -hmm.